Hi, everybody. This is Davina with Fertility Within Reach. And I would like to welcome you to our webinar on healthcare for the South Asian community. We're focusing on fertility healthcare. And we are joined by our experts today, Dr. Shaw and Dr. Jane. Um, and I'm going to read their bios so you know who they are, and then we will start asking some questions. But it's really important that you understand a little bit about them so you understand their expertise and their interest. So Dr. Neera Shah is a double board certified OBGYN and reproductive endocrinologist and fertility specialist at Nova IVF in Mountain View, California. She received her bachelor's at UC Berkeley in neurobiology and South Asian studies. She went on to complete a post-baccalaureate research fellowship at the National Institute of Health Academy and attended Stanford Medical School. Dr. Shaw finished her residency at the University of California, San Francisco and her fellowship at Stanford University in reproductive endocrinology and infertility. Dr. Shaw has authored research articles on topics ranging from fertility preservation, pregnancy loss, reproductive genetics, and ethic dif ethnic differences in IVF outcomes. Her work on the disparities in IVF outcomes in South Asian patients has been featured in Fertility and Sterility and Fertility IQ. Her medical practice incorporates the highest level of evidence-based medicine and tailored care and the most cutting edge technologies to optimize outcomes for her patients. So we are very grateful Dr. Shah is with us. And Dr. Jane, he has been a fertility within reach, go-to resource for almost a decade now. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about Dr. Jane. He is an associate professor at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and medical director of the Northwestern Medicine, Fertility and Reproductive Medicine West Region. He completed his Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility Fellowship at Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is har connected with Harvard Medical School, and his OBGYN residency at the University of Washington. He holds dual Bachelor of Science degrees in Biomedical and Electrical Engineering from the University of Southern California and a Master's of Science in Biomedical Engineering from the University of Texas at Austin and an MD with the highest distinction from the University of Southern California. Dr. Jane has over 20 years of clinical assisted reproductive technology experience in private and academic settings. For the past 18 years, he has been actively involved on numerous national committees of the Society for Assisted Reproductive Technology and the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, including being chair of the SART Practice Committee. Dr. Jane has authored the book, The Infertility Journal, and runs a fertility blog. He is a health services researcher who is recognized for his work on the impact of mandated insurance coverage on IVF utilization and outcomes, and on identifying and better understanding racial and socioeconomic disparities in the care of infertility patients. Both of you, I am so honored and appreciative that you are here with us today to talk about fertility health care for the South Asian community. So I am going to um, just welcome our, our doctors. If you would um, like to say, if I missed anything, Dr. Shaw, is there anything else you would like to share with, with the group? No, I wanted to thank you for that really kind introduction. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Dr. Jane? Same. Gosh, it's, thank you so much, Davina. It's really been an honor to be working with you for so many years and to get to know you. And um, I'm really excited that you're hosting this important topic. 
Thank you. It is important. This is something that if I personally and we as Fertility Within Reach, an organization, we really believe in um, that the South Asian community has really been an underserved, uh, under recognized, there's an under recognized need, it's an underserved population. And, and so this, we feel very passionately about getting information to patients um, and, and families of patients so they can share and, and have a better understanding. So Dr. Shaw, I'm gonna start with you with our first question. Um, culture can play a large role in the perception of our health. So what ideals or taboos in the South Asian community impact how infertility is viewed in your opinion, experience, expertise? This is a great question. And I wanna say first off that infertility does not discriminate in any way um, with ethnicity, race, socioeconomic status. And it's something that's universal um, across the world. I do feel that certain cultures stigmatize infertility differently. There's a spectrum. And from firsthand experience, you know, I'm a South Asian first generation myself. Um, I have a lot of family members in India and I've certainly experienced firsthand that there is a lot of taboo associated with infertility and people are ashamed to even talk about it. And one of the missions that I've been on is to increase awareness. And I've done that through social media and other mechanisms to increase awareness on how common it is. Um, we know that it affects at least one out of every eight, but I believe that might be an underestimate. It probably affects more than that. And um, what I have seen in my experience is that Having children in the Indian community is so, so closely linked to your social status, your reputation, um, in many cases, you know, the inheritance of wealth. And for women, it really, it really sort of um, signifies their identity and in many ways their self-worth. So struggling with infertility is, is devastating for especially women, but for couples as well. It can, it can completely ostracize them from their families. Um, I know people that have been disowned by their family members because they were unable to have children. So it can be very, very extreme. And I wanted to share with you all a, um, an anecdote um, from about 10 years ago when I took care of a couple at the San Francisco General Hospital um, as an OBGYN resident. So um, I was taking care of a woman who was about in her early 60s um, uh, from India originally, and they had moved to California, and she was pregnant. She was about 20 weeks pregnant. And um, she had actually struggled with infertility for many years, decades, and just was not, not able to seek care for many reasons. And I think part of our conversation today is to talk about barriers to care. Um, which I know Dr. Jane will, will highlight a little bit later on too. But for, for many reasons, she did not seek the care that she needed. So by the time she was ready to actually seek care, it was too late and she was not able to conceive using her own eggs. And at the time, again, she was, her age had been above the cutoff for which most clinics in the United States would not provide care. So according to the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, it's highly and strongly recommended that that women over 55, you know, should not conceive and have a pregnancy because of the high nature of pregnancy risks. So this individual, this couple had actually gone back to India and with the use of donor eggs, had gotten pregnant with twins. And when she reached her second trimester, she flew back to the United States to resume her prenatal care. And this is the first time that I had met her, 20 weeks in pregnancy, presenting with high blood pressure, and preeclampsia, which is a very, very common condition that we see, um, particularly in women of advanced maternal age. And unfortunately, due to the severity of her condition, she had to, her only option was to terminate the pregnancy. And I had many conversations with this family and what she expressed to me was truly heartbreaking. She basically told me that if she did not have a child, that her family was gonna completely disown her take away any inheritance, wealth, or land um, given that was supposed to be granted to them. And the idea of that was so debilitating to this couple that they were willing to go to any means to have a child. 
And it was just so heartbreaking to for her to have gone through this process. And there's just so many things that were wrong with this. But to me, this highlighted so many different things. It highlighted some of the barriers to care. You know, I often see that South Asian couples are late to seeking care, you know, for a variety of different reasons, whether it's a language barrier, the stigma, the taboo of infertility. It's just something that I see every single day in my practice. You know, I practice in the Bay Area where I see a very large South Asian demographic. And these are patterns that I see on a daily basis. And, you know, I think that this is what we're on a mission on, mission on Dr. Jane and I and the rest of our South Asian colleagues is to really increase awareness of how common it is, destigmatize infertility so that couples know that it's normal. We want to normalize this so that they feel comfortable. And I think by um, having providers like us that look like them, relate to them, understand their cultural background, we can allow them to feel more comfortable and safe. And, um, you know, we're not going to be judgmental and we really truly understand where they're coming from. So I wanted to bring up that example because that stuck with me for so many years and I think illustrates so many of the issues that there are with fertility in our community. Thank you for that. Do you, do you think gender is a factor? Do you think there's an understanding of male factor and female factor or do they do does it seem like the woman will always be blamed no matter what and uh, or is it an individual issue or a couple issue? Well, I think that's a great question as well. You know, Indian culture tends to be very patriarchal and I think a lot of the blame of infertility tends to fall on the women and that's not just unique to the South Asian community. I think that's unique across. I mean, that's something universally seen. But, you know, we all know that infertility is oftentimes multifactorial and male factor infertility is actually extremely common. In fact, it, it affects at least a third up to a half of all couples. And so, again, this is where we need to increase awareness and help couples realize that this is something that really involves both male and female factors. And so in our community, I think this is something that's understated that we, we don't have enough understanding of. And so when I see couples... Sometimes I'll see that the male partner won't even present to the consultation. They don't even think that they're the problem at all. And so, I mean, that's a red flag from the beginning. And oftentimes I'll, once I explore more, I'll understand that there might be issues with erectile dysfunction, um, with sexual intercourse and vaginismus. These are conditions that I anecdotally see are higher in this community of patients. So again, I think we have to do a better job of um, normalizing that infertility can be caused by both male and female factors, and particularly in our community to normalize that so that so that couples can present together and support one another on their journey to have a child. Thank you for clarifying that. I, I, I wondered about that. You know, Dr. Jane, I'm wondering, why do you think the South Asian community is underserved in the medical community and, and is there something medical doctors are doing about it? Is there something they need to do about it? Is there something the patients need to be doing about it? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, totally. Uh, well, I totally agree with Dr. Shah, everything she said. Um, so I, I, I also like, I was also born in India and I came when I was nine. And so I have a lot of um, roots with India and, and interact with Indian families and have lots of Indian patients. And um, everything that Dr. Shah mentioned is so true. And the barriers are so many. Um, I think one of the big ones, which Dr. Shah was talking about is the whole stigma behind it, right? Like it's it's one of those things where it's so culturally thought of. And again, these are sort of generalizations. It's not necessary that everyone feels the same way, but in, in general, there it's, it's a feeling of um, failure and um, sort of self-blame and shame. Um, where because of those feelings, I think people are very hesitant to like reach out, um, to even talk about it with other people to like figure out, you know, this is not just you, this is like every other person practically, um, and that there are resources and support that exist. So one is just like the idea of communication is just very limited. Um, and it's also on top of that, more felt to be like, the woman's issue rather than a male issue. It's rare that a guy is going to be the one who initiates it. Um, you know, so it's often there's a lot of shame and blame and, and lack of communication. So that in itself 
I think, delays seeking care until things are like really bad. Um, so it could be a longer period of time before a patient potentially seeks care. That's one thing. And then South Asians are not all the same. So there's like a population of South Asians who recently immigrated. And then there's like, like maybe people like us or like second generation. So sort of different issues come up. Like one is language, especially for people who recently came from South Asia here. So language often becomes an issue. Um, I, I happen to speak Hindi, so like that makes a difference um, in communicating with patients. But often the other thing is a lot of South Asian patients want to preferentially see Indian providers or South Asian providers. And I think they'll seek those out. And if they don't find them, they're less likely to also come in for treatment. And I think that sort of applies in general. I think people generally want to see people of their own sort of background, so to speak. Um, and that in itself is a barrier to care for other other populations as well, Hispanic and African-American, um, but definitely on the South Asian side. Um, so I think if they don't see, like Dr. Shah said, I mean, you're, you're like inundated with South Asian patients as am I, right? Like, because they see us as one of them, they feel like we'll be able to relate, understand, communicate um, what some of these cultural issues are. So I, I think I think that's another another big one. Um, uh, cost can potentially be a barrier too. This stuff is so expensive, um, especially in non-mandated states. Um, just being able to afford the treatment is is really tough. Um, so that can be certainly another barrier as well. Um, uh, I, I think uh, uh, sort of knowledge gaps is another one, like not understanding what the factors may be that could be going on. Um, you know, someone may have irregular cycles for a long period of time, but not realize like that's a simple thing that can be corrected um, or what that may be. What is PCOS, for example? Um, uh, or on the male side, like, I mean, the male side is often not even considered uh, uh, but half the time, as Dr. Shah said, there's sperm issues, erectile dysfunction issues um, that just go ignored. Um, so I think there's there's so many things to this. I can keep going on, but I'll-, I'll, no, I'll Well, actually that kind of leads to like my next question. If you can answer, what are some of the common causes of infertility in both South Asian men and women? Is there- are there conditions that are more predominant in with this culture? As we know from research, there are certain conditions that are more common in um, black women uh, that are more prevalent than some somebody of other race. So do you see that with the South Asian community? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the one is PCOS um, on the female side. Um, Would you mind explaining what that is? Yeah, it stands for polycystic ovary syndrome. It's actually the most common hormonal dysfunction in women. It's just super common. Probably about eight to ten percent of women overall have PCOS. Um, and I think in the South Asian population, there are some estimates of maybe closer to like 40, 45 percent. Wow. Um, which is really high. Um, and it, it's essentially there's an imbalance of hormones that affect prevent the ovaries from growing and releasing a follicle and releasing an egg. So they don't necessarily ovulate on a regular basis and therefore they don't get a period on a regular basis. Um, it's associated with other issues like increased testosterone production. So the associated issues could be acne or increased hair growth. And in fact, it's a simple diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis, essentially having irregular cycles, meaning it's not clockwork periods. Sometimes it could be 40 days, 70 days, 50 days. It's all over the place. Um, having that history along with some evidence of increased testosterone gives the diagnosis essentially. And an ultrasound can confirm it. And, and so the, the issue, and it's also tied to diabetes and body weight. So in the Indian South Asian population, there's a higher prevalence of type two diabetes, there's likely some sort of a genetic link, 
linking the two. So there's often a family history of diabetes as well. And those patients with PCOS are at increased risk for it. Mm. Um, so from a fertility side, it's ovulatory dysfunction. That's the issue that can lower the chances of getting pregnant. Um, so I think PCOS is just super common on the female side, but besides that age and decreased reserve is also another issue. So age for age, matching South Asian women to Caucasian women, South Asian women are more likely to have lower egg reserve, meaning whatever eggs, so whatever eggs women have they're born with, but for an unclear reason, South Asian women have a faster decline in egg reserve. Um, so, but the, but we don't know why. We don't know why. Um, it may likely be some sort of a genetic predisposition, but it's not clear why. Um, Is but, there research being done on it, or we need it still? I think we need it. I I don't think there's a lot of research being done on it unfortunately. Um, but it's one of those things. I mean, I'm sure Dr. Shah, you, you probably see this a lot too, right? Like in, 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 in South Asians, it's like, they tend to not for the same age, they tend to not respond as well to medications, not have the same number of eggs or the quality of eggs and embryos. Um, yes, I, I've definitely seen that in my experience as well. I've even, you know, I would be interested to see if there's any data on their embryo development and quality as well, because I, I also see that their blast rates are lower, the number of embryos that are usable to transfer is lower, and um, just their egg quality in general tends to be very different. Um, and, and so I think that we do need to do more research, and these are difficult things to study, and there's a lot of heterogeneity. You know, when you talk about South Asians, just like you talked about, there's, you know, there's the whole well, India, Indians living in India, and then there's the whole diaspora of people who've immigrated to other countries. And how much of this is related to genetics? How much of it's related to environment? And we just don't know that. And um, and then, you know, when you look at data, you know, from South Asian couples, it's really only looking at the, the female partner. It's not really looking at the um, ethnic background of the male partner. And we know that there's a lot more, you know, biracial couples now. And so there's just a lot of limitations to the data sets that we have. And there's just a lot more work that we need to do, but these are difficult studies to do. But I think Dr. Jane, you and I probably have similar anecdotal experiences from seeing that these women do have lower reserve. They do need to do more treatment cycles to achieve the same outcomes as compared to their Caucasian counterparts. Totally. And and that makes it even more challenging because they already waited a little bit longer, perhaps, to get to us. And then they have potentially lower egg reserve. And there's this huge cultural pressure to have success. And, and it's really big. Like, I mean, many of my Indian patients, it's like the parents or in-laws are often part of the conversation. Like, it's brought up like, you know, I'm, I'm under a lot of pressure from X or Y person, um, or my in-laws are staying with us and it's really hard, or my parents will be visiting and I really need this to happen right away. Um, uh, there, there's a lot of familial pressure coming in on top of the pressure that already exists. Right. I, I'm wondering when the families are putting the pressure on, on the couple um, and do, do the patients usually communicate very much with their families? Is this something that is usually private? How, what is your experience um, in being able to kind of have those conversations or, or is that really frowned upon and people don't wanna have that conversation? Ooh, it's you go, you, you go first. I, I mean, I was just going to say my experience has been that, again, this is a generalization, but I think that vulnerability is not something that you typically will see um, in the community about sharing, you know, whether it's infertility or pregnancy loss. I think many people keep it very, very private. Again, there's a lot of shame associated with it and sharing that is sort of highlighting that. Um, exposing that um, and potentially tainting the reputation of their family. So I think, you know, maybe within the nuclear family, there might be some sharing going on. 
Um, but outside of that, I find that people are very, very closed off um, again, because they don't want to, you know, reveal anything that could potentially compromise the status of their family. Yeah, it's really such a tough thing for people to like openly talk about in, in, in the South Asian community, because there's a tendency to want to portray an image of success and, and, and this is not seen as that. Um, this is seen as a struggle and a failure. And so um, there, there, there really is like a major barrier towards like communication. And, and then internally, even within a family, I think it depends on the family dynamics. Um, Cause like the pressure to have a child can come from one set of parents or the other, or both. Um, it, it, if it comes from the husband's side, like the in-laws, like that's really, really tough. And then it depends on what the communication is between husband and wife. So um, if the, I think the key is to have a supportive partner um, who can then sort of tell the, tell the in-laws or like, Hey, like, you know, ease up, like, you know, don't bring this stuff up. Like don't, don't use sort of hurtful language that things like, you know, you just need to relax or you need to eat this or you need to drink that. There's a lot of home remedies that, that often come into the picture. Oh, you sh you're working too hard. You're walking too much. You're, you should not work. You should like stay in bed and all kinds of things that are just not helpful. Uh, so yeah, this, this is like, right. Like, no, it's true. It's true. I wore a necklace with a frog. I like every day, you know, so you'll do, sometimes you'll just do whatever it, it, it takes. You'll try whatever. Um, but you're right. A lot of times it's not helpful and it has nothing to do with anything. Oh, I mean, if, if you choose to do that, it's totally cool. But if like someone's telling you, you need to do that, it becomes, totally, I, know. Yeah. I was just covering my bases, you know, <laughs> <laughs> just, just in case, but Dr. Shaw, you said, a key word that I have learned since I have now built my family after infertility, you use the word vulnerability. And I once heard from Andrea Sirtash of Pregnantish. Um, she spoke about how when we can be vulnerable with one another, that actually allows the opportunity to deepen and strengthen a relationship. And it's not just between a husband and a wife. It can be between friends. It can be between a child and a parent. So when you, when you said that, that really resonated with me that it is very much being vulnerable and raw and it is a risk. Um, a lot of times it, if you don't feel secure in that relationship, and, uh, and, but it, the, I think there's also a, can be a level of respect. I'm now on the other side of it, you know, with, with families reacting differently to um, their child or their daughter-in-law having infertility. Um, it, it's astounding some of the things that are said, but I do think when you allow yourself to be vulnerable, you do create an opportunity to have a, a stronger bond, um, whether it happens or not, you have no control over, but uh, you're at least creating that opportunity. That's a really positive way of thinking about it in a way. Um, Absolutely. Just, it, it takes a lot of courage to be vulnerable. And I always think that, you know, the net effect is positive, whether, you know, there may be some people that perhaps don't respond or react the way that you want, but I think overall you will end up connecting with individuals who maybe have had a shared experience um, that you will feel so much more close with. And I'm very open about sharing my own fertility journey. In fact, I've used, and I, I am a very private person, so it took a lot of courage for me to be vulnerable, especially in a, in a social media setting, but, you know, I now have a, an, a public account where I educate women um, and couples about infertility related topics. And I've also shared my own journey, which has been very difficult. You know, I've encountered a lot of pregnancy losses and 
I've shared that. And I can't tell you what that experience did for me. I mean, I thought here I am trying to help other people, but in fact, it was therapeutic for me to feel like somebody reached out to me and said, hey, you know, your post really resonated with me. Thank you for sharing this. I don't feel as alone. I know that this is common and it wasn't my fault. And just that connection with somebody that I've never met just through a social media interaction was, I think, therapeutic on both ends. So I've certainly found that in being vulnerable, and again, and I, especially in my family, I think we tend to be very closed off and private for all the reasons we've talked about. It's taken a lot of courage for me to be vulnerable, but in the process of that, there has been tremendous benefit, not only for me, but for the community that I um, interact with online. Thank you for sharing that with us. I mean, you didn't have to, and I appreciate that you did. You, and and I think that can only draw more people to you, right? Like that you do understand. So thank you. I'm I'm wondering, especially because you have um, done some research and in, into fertility preservation. When a patient, especially if we know that this community it seems like the sooner they receive treatment, the potentially the better outcome it can be rather than delaying it. Um, what are your thoughts about fertility preservation and the South Asian community or, or, or when to seek treatment and how to find the best care? Well, I think, you know, both Dr. Dane and I see you know, a very select patient population that's struggling with infertility. So we have a very biased perspective on um, fertility preservation. I think we probably would both agree that it's never too early to think about it and consider the option of it um, because, you know, it is, it can be a very effective plan B if plan A doesn't work out. And so I, um, I really believe that every woman should get educated on their options. Not everybody might choose to pursue egg freezing or embryo freezing, but at a minimum to have a conversation with someone like us who has the expertise to talk about how to interpret ovarian reserve markers. And, you know, as a side point, I want all, every audience member to know that your ovarian reserve marker does not predict your ability to conceive naturally, um, if you find out that your reserve markers are low, it's not a reason to panic, but perhaps it's a reason to have a conversation about freezing your eggs, especially if you're on the cusp of turning 35 or older than that. So again, I think education is really important. Having a consultation with an expert where you can talk about what your fertility goals are, the family size that you desire, when you wish to start a family, those are all really important conversations and hard ones to have, but really important so that, you know, we know that infertility is common. You don't want to end up being one of those one in eight or one in six who end up having to go through IVF in multiple cycles. You know, very rare that a patient's journey is linear and that you just do one cycle and one transfer and boom, you have your baby. It's very circuitous for most pa patients. And if you have frozen eggs from an earlier age, chances are that you'll have to do far fewer number of cycles to achieve the same goal. So at a minimum, I think education is important, getting a consultation to talk about whether this is good for you based on your goals is really important. Um, not everybody might choose to it. And my goal is never to push or you know convince somebody that they have to do it, but rather to educate them on their options and let them make an informed choice for themselves. Oh, uh, yeah, I was just going to say, I, I couldn't agree more with that. I think I think that's like the key to all of this is to start early with just education. Um, and, and through that, they can be just better informed and then empowered to make better choices. And so it's not so much that everyone who comes in needs to do treatment or needs to undergo fertility preservation. But I think just being empowered with that knowledge of what what the tests are, what they mean, um, and what are the choices you can make now versus later? I, I think that can just be empowering and ho hopefully, hopefully a little bit more liberating, um, mm -hmm. and allow for more communication to happen, um, with others. I think that's great. You know, I, seeking treatment is such a personal decision and I, it, 
you wanted fertility within reach really to be about empowering people to make informed decisions uh, about their care or empowering them to fight for insurance coverage or, you know, but it was all about education and patient empowerment. And a lot of people are very private, but I, I think there are good resources out there whether they want to be vocal or uh, and share with friends and family, or whether they are more to themselves, there are some resources that I think are very beneficial to um, patients and this community. I know that I have a list, I have it right in front of me um, of some resources. If you know of any, I, I would love to hear your thoughts and your suggestions. I know that Nova IVF has a blog. Um, does it focus on a uh, particular community or is it for everybody, but it, it, it really does serve the community? It is, it is for everyone. I mean, our patient population is very diverse. Um, so we do try to create content that can connect with people of different backgrounds. Um, so we do try to keep it pretty, pretty diverse. That's great. And Dr. Jane, you have a blog too, right? I do. Um, but I, I, I feel like it, there needs to be more of a, it's, it's sort of a general like mm -hmm. fertility blog. So it's not focused per se to South Asians, for example. Um, but I, I feel like what you're doing through fertility and reach would be, is fantastic and in, in kind of really focusing on the specifics like we're talking about and then having some sort of an educational material and an ongoing education that's focused i think that's like fantastic because i think people again like when you have something focused and specific to people that they can resonate with they're more likely to like get drawn to it and, and hopefully learn from it yes yeah, so, I and mean, we are creating this brochure you know, that's specific about the South Asian community and fertility health care. And uh, I will tell you, we are going to list resources. One of my favorite resources that is not so much community specific or population specific, but it does help educate really well about different medical conditions. And that is the Society for Women's Health Research. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Jane and I uh, had participated in a panel which kind of shared information about infertility, but they do have, they have um, resources, I believe. Well, I know they have one on uterine fibroids. I know they have one for endometriosis. And those conditions are found also in the, the South Asian community, correct? For sure. Right. And, and um, Fertility IQ. Fertility IQ is another resource. They have fertility patients of South Asian heritage. They have some information. Um, and then we found some Instagram communities. And I'm going to type those into the chat because... You know, the, the at symbol doesn't match the name necessarily. Um, and so I'm just going to type those in so everybody can see them. And then there's also for the Indian egg donors, there's a, um, what were you going to say, Dr. Jane? You're shaking oh, your head. I, yes. I, that just, I'm glad you brought that up because that's another huge area where we need more help with because quite a few... Indian women have issues with egg reserve, as we spoke of, and to the point where they um, are not able to have success with their own eggs, and then they need to look for donor eggs, and they for certainly want to find young Indian women who are egg donors, um, and, and that's a tough thing to find. Um, so I think that's another whole area where um, it's a challenge, um, and there, I think there, there are agencies that are trying to recruit young South Asian women for having eggs to donate. So that, but that's another need that exists. Dr. Shah, do you have thoughts on that? I, I, I 
couldn't agree more. I think um, it's a very, very small pool of um, South Asian egg donors out there. And there's probably many reasons for that. Again, we can do a better job of educating these young women about the safety um, and efficacy of, of the process. And um, I've certainly taken it on as a personal mission to do more education and outreach in my local communities through um, Stanford University, different different um, graduate programs here, um, and even younger women, you know, who are in college to, to really be thinking about, you know, whether they could be a good candidate and, you know, do something for another couple. But, um, you know, I do find that it's a struggle for a lot of my South Asian patients that that do need to use an egg donor that they often end up having to use, you know, either Hispanic donors or donors that are, you know, maybe have similar physical characteristics, but don't have the South Asian, you know, heritage and background. And I think that there, there's a sense of, you know, as it is that decision to use a donor, as difficult as it is, and then to not be able to use a South Asian donor is another level of grief that they have to cope with. So I think we can do a lot better in, in getting the word out and increasing the diversity of our egg donors so that, that couples have more options. That's great. I, I'm i curious, just because I'm not uh, uh, educated in this, you know, are there specific groups or churches or clubs or organizations or fraternities or sororities that do focus um, on the South Asian community where we can reach out to them and share our information and our educational material and our resources and and just kind of spread it out. Are, are there are there is there anyone that you can think of that we need to be connecting with? Um, to help share this information? Gosh, that, that's a great question. I, I think what comes to mind is um, there many cities have South Asian cultural organizations um, and then the, and religious based organizations. So um, I think many cities have um, temples where a lot of South Asians come to or gather and and that that may be one potential avenue or they're, they're so affiliated with a cultural or slash religious based organization where perhaps the person or people leading those organizations would be a great source for disseminating such information, I think. I, I agree. I, I can't think of a single organization that would reach out to the entire community. I know that there are social media influencers that might be um, potentially of interest to reach out to because they have such a large audience. But I, I agree, it sort of has to be on a grassroots level where you're talking to local communities or community leaders of South Asian communities. I know that in many college universities, they might have like a, a cultural association or, you know, some sort of, again, like Dr. Jane was saying, like some sort of community built around the South Asian culture. So I think it might be just a matter of figuring out, maybe starting with big metropolitan areas what those organizations are and starting there and spreading the word, you know, through those types of mechanisms. You know, there's a challenge, you, you've you made it clear, the challenge with egg donors. Is it the same for sperm donors or gestational carriers? Hmm. Is there a... Uh, it doesn't, that doesn't come into play as much. Like I've not really run into, to too many patients where the, they tend not to want to go the sperm donor too. I think um, mm, it's, so, yeah, I just have not run into that being much of an issue. And on the gestational carrier side as well, like um, that's usually not very common, at least in my Indian patient population, a need for. Um, so, and the other thing I'll mention though, is that a decent number of Indian patients also will travel to India. So in situations like this, uh, and, and often otherwise, like they're, they're frequently going to India to visit. And, and so they'll often go to India, see a fertility doctor out there, get some tests done, maybe even do a procedure or two. Um, and in certain circumstances, as actually Dr. Shah, you mentioned, you had that patient who went to India for, for donor egg. So the cost in India is, a fraction of the cost here, like less than half. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
cost often drives people to get stuff done in India as well. Um, yeah. Yes. International IVF. I yeah. know. I know. And 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 it's a um, really massive um, industry in India now. Like there's lots of fertility clinics that have opened up in the past four or five years because um, it's a huge population and there's been not too much being done. Like, again, like the stigma is so big, um, but I think finally people have at least had enough that they, they're, they're, they're realizing like these people need help and, and we can provide these services. And so, I mean. Yeah. You know. And it helps that a lot of, you know, celebrities and people in the mainstream media are talking about their fertility journeys. You know, Priyanka Chopra is an example of someone who used IVF and surrogacy to build a family. And we know other Bollywood celebrities have been open about sharing their IVF journey. So I think, again, that normalization in, is helping to spread the word and help destigmatize destigmatize infertility so that couples can decrease at least that barrier to seek care seek care earlier in their treatment cycles. Yeah. Thank you both so much. I wanted to see if there was anything else that you know, you thought you'd like to share or any more thoughts, uh, the patient who's listening and just isn't sure, is there anything you'd like to communicate to them or anything you think we just haven't yet covered that you think is important for them to know? There's one thing that I was going to also say is that um, I've, in, in, in especially in um, the older generation of South Asians, there's a tendency to think that this is sort of a social or a cultural problem as opposed to a medical problem. Um, so I, I just wanted to mention that, that, you know, infertility is obviously, we all know this, it's a disease, it's a medical condition. It's not a social problem. It's not something that's a choice that people make. And I think that needs to be better brought, brought out to for people to know that this it's just like any other medical condition that people have. If you have high blood pressure, you go to the doctor. If you have diabetes, you go to the doctor, you, you, you get treatments. So this really should be no different. Um, and we have to get beyond sort of the cultural taboos that drive, drive the, the, the lack of access. Yes. I I will, I will tell you a little personal story. Um, I remember my mother-in-law when she found out I had endometriosis and needed to have a laparoscopy. She called my husband and said uh, she heard that was caused from STDs and he should get checked. And uh, which we know it is not caused by STDs, but I'm laughing because you know, I think families, they, they, for the most part, you know, they, they're well, what's the term? Well-meaning. Mean, mean well, yeah. Uh, yeah, they mean well, right? But they lack information and knowledge. So we do have to have the courage to kind of educate. And I think that was what I learned as a patient that I, I would say to any patient is, People don't know what you need to hear. Uh, and so, and only you know that. So you, if you have a need in the communication, you need to let them know what is helpful and, and what is well-meaning, but hurtful. And then if they continue to do it, then that's a whole other issue. But Otherwise, they they really have no idea. So I just encourage patients to kind of find the the courage and and the support from your spouse to you know have a conversation and be vulnerable, but to educate um, that this is a disease and uh, that you have the best of the best doctors. I mean, look at the two of you right? Like best of the best doctors working on this, researching on this, and you're sharing this information, 
you know, with each other and, and um, great care is out there um, waiting for patients. So I'm just so grateful for both of you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. This has been a great conversation. And um, like we said early on, I think um, one of the ways that we can improve access to care is just by having more South Asian providers out there. And I know when I first started practicing out here, I think I was one, one of the only South Asian uh, reproductive specialists in the Bay Area. And since you know I've started practicing, there, there's been at least a few more that have um, started practicing in the Bay Area. I know that there's many more South Asian, first generation, second generation South Asian Americans that are going through REI fellowships and graduating. So I think, um, again, I know that patients feel really comfortable seeking care from someone that looks like them, that understands them, that won't judge them, that understands their cultural background. And I think we're seeing shifts in that. And I, it gives me a lot of hope that hopefully that will be one of the ways that we can really improve care to this community. I hope so too. Uh, I'm just going to share again for people who are gonna be watching this, that this is where they can find you both on Instagram, that you know during this conversation, we've talked about cultural perspectives. We've talked about how to expand the healthcare um, to reach the patient's underlying conditions and perhaps early, early care to prevent some issues, um, fertility treatment and preservation considerations, how to seek support. And you shared your closing thoughts. I mean, and we're Fertility Within Reach is going to have our South Asian population brochure and fertility healthcare releasing in 2023. This webinar is going to be made repeatedly available um, and it's going to live on our YouTube station uh, at our channel and anybody will when we have the um, brochure published it will be on our website which is fertilitywithinreach.org under our literature resources cannot wait for this to be um, published so uh Thank you both for joining us and, and sharing our passion about getting information and, and educating uh, the public. Um, just really, you're outstanding and patients are lucky to have you. Gosh, thank you so much, Davina. This was like fabulous. It was long awaited and much overdue and really glad to be part of it. Wow. Yeah, same. It was, thank you for highlighting this topic. I think it's really, really important. Um, and it was really nice to share the panel with you, Dr. Jane. I know you have so much great perspective and knowledge. So it was really great to have um, this, this panel together today. Thanks Same. for the opportunity. Thank you.